indicates I've been asked to talk about what is D deficiency and uh, what kinds of actions should we be taking as a consequence of that understanding. I've been asked to uh, speak about disclosures, and I have none in, in this case. The, the vitamin D field uh, uh, has so little commercial interest that, <laughs> that there's no opportunity for them to corrupt your speakers here today. We don't have to worry about that. But the CME people around the world are obsessive about this, and so we have to, uh, uh, have to correspond. Now, um, uh, uh, the objectives for my presentation are to define nutrient deficiency, which uh, Cedric spoke about, but I'll try to define it a little more uh, completely. Cite evidence relating to what it takes to have enough vitamin D. Uh, we'll estimate the vitamin D inputs that are needed to sustain that sufficiency. I'll give you some estimate of the prevalence of deficiency that probably isn't necessary in this room because you've tested it in your cells or in your patients, and so you know how common it is. Characterize the effects of universal vitamin D supplementation. What would happen if we did this at a population level? And that will be what I'll try to, uh, uh, to spend some time on. And finally, I'll define the safe upper limit of vitamin D as far as we now know it. Now, a working definition of a deficiency is that it's any condition in which inadequate intake of a nutrient results in significant dysfunction or disease. And conversely, nutrient adequacy is the situation in which further increases in intake produce no further reduction in dysfunction or disease, acknowledging that there may be other causes for dysfunction or disease. And this is not a panacea, but there is some component of that dysfunction or disease which may be related to a nutrient. Uh, and so these two halves of this definition, I think, go together. Now, <clears throat> uh, classically, in the beginning of nutrition as a science, the steps that Cedric just reviewed for us, we started with a nutrient deficiency, which we ultimately figured out was working through some biochemical mechanism. And that resulted in a short latency disease, that is, a disease that came on in a period of weeks or at most months, so that it was feasible to do the type of investigation which would elucidate that. Uh, and a short latency was absolutely necessary because the prevailing paradigm at the turn of the 19th, 20th century was that all disease, all human disease, was caused by external invaders, either, either microbes or toxins, poisons of some kind or another. And much of the approach to medicine in the first 50 years of the 20th century was devoted to dealing with that kind of a paradigm. Uh, and when E.V. McCollum started to call attention to the importance of nutrients, he was literally laughed off the stage by medical colleagues because he claimed that not eating something could make you sick. Uh, we've come now to take that for granted as what we mean by nutrient deficiency disease, but it was a hard birth for the science because it was, it was rejected. Now, with respect to this paradigm, we see if we plug vitamin D into the story that D deficiency operates through malabsorption of calcium and phosphorus, and that results in rickets uh, or osteomalacia in adults. <coughs> Uh, that was the short latency deficiency disease occurring in months after deprivation. Now, uh, it wouldn't have been possible early on to find the long latency disease because there was just no way to span the time of years that might be necessary uh, in order to see that connection. Uh, but there is no logical reason why there couldn't have been a long latency effect of inadequate calcium and phosphorus absorption. And in fact, we know that that's now the case with osteoporosis. Not the only cause of osteoporosis by any means, but it's one way to get or to worsen the condition. That is, vitamin D deficiency contributes to, to that uh, part of the disease burden. Now, uh, having gotten this far, we can see immediately that there isn't a necessarily just a single mechanism by which a nutrient may act. But because nutrition had grown up around single nutrient deficiency diseases, we kind of had a mechanism for that. And so I've lumped all the others under this heading of non-index mechanisms. And that means, you know, anything other than malabsorption of calcium and phosphorus as far as vitamin D is concerned. Uh, and you see immediately that there is this logical, 
set of possibilities, uh, short and long latency deficiency disease, both for the index and for the non-index mechanisms. And when we look at vitamin D, uh, 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 but look on this side, we see that we're looking through the lens of genomic signaling, which can result in cancer, as we'll be discussing later today, or falls, uh, or uh, hypertension, or various immune disorders, or periodontitis, or diabetes. Uh, all of these disorders will be discussed at some length today, and they're all presumably related through one of these non-index mechanisms, which I've kind of lumped under this heading of genomic signaling. Now, the beauty of this scheme, um, uh, and at the same time the perverse side of it, is that if we define this as deficiency, what do we call all the rest of this? And in my broader term, uh, I would call it all deficiency. But much of what we read in the literature today calls uh, rickets and osteomalacia, deficiency disease, and all the rest of this, they call it insufficiency, which uh, has, has no logical basis, but if you read the literature, even some of the grassroots uh, literature, uh, uh, you'll see that term insufficiency used, and I think that's actually confusing the issue. But one, I, mean, I mean, you see immediately how rich this scheme is heuristically. It allows us to approach this problem from a variety of different angles. But uh, 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 immediately we see that the input needed to, pre to prevent this outcome, that is rickets in children, 100 units per day, maybe 200 units on the outside, is not enough to prevent this and is often not enough to prevent these. Uh, a familiar example, of course, with folic acid, the deficiency, the quotes deficiency disease for folic acid is macrocytic anemia. The amount of folate needed to prevent macrocytic anemia is not enough to prevent neural tube defects in pregnant to, uh, uh, or in fetal uh, development. So uh, uh, the scheme allows us, as I say in this title, to rethink this whole approach to deficiency disease and uh, is for that reason, as I say, heuristically useful. Perversely, however, the input needed to prevent this is still the principal basis for current intake recommendations for most nutrients. It's, it's certainly the case for the current IOM recommendations for vitamin D. Both Mark Hollick and I served on the panel that came up with those numbers in 1997. And uh, all we can say in self-defense is that most of what we know today about vitamin D hadn't been known in 1997. So, uh, we've learned 97% actually of what we now know <laughs> in the last 10 years, basically. So the question is, what is the right endpoint? Or perhaps better put, what is the more useful endpoint under these uh, circumstances? And uh, another way to look at this is, what is the operative model for nutrition? Uh, actually, if you stop to think about it, uh, the, there are several of those models out there, and they're used by different people for different purposes. The media and the regulators use one, nutritional policymakers use another, and nutritional physiologists use yet another. And I'm going to review these very briefly because deficiency means different things to these different model systems. Now, for the media and for regulators, nutrition is about killing yourself with a fork. It's about avoiding risk. It's about warnings and cautions. And if you think about what you read in the literature, you'll see that that's true. Here, for instance, we express this in our formal regulations. This is the nutrition fact label for a package of macaroni and cheese. And you see here, right at the top, necessarily in boldface type, the first things you read are the nutrients you're supposed to limit. <coughs> That's, that's official FDA government policy. Whereas the possibly uh, advantageous nutrients tend to be toward the bottom and are often optional and need not be listed and not in bold face. The overwhelming majority of, of media reports in the daily newspaper is about harm that comes from eating too much of something. I don't have to remind you about salt and cholesterol and fat and trans fat, etc. These are all ways of revisiting the century-old paradigm that all disease is caused by external invaders, that is, poisons of some kind. So it's nutrition as toxicology. And while the explanation is partly that harm is more newsworthy, people are going to write stories about that than his benefit, and the media, of course, battens on controversy, still the impression that's conveyed to the general public is one of concern and danger. You have to be careful. <coughs> 
what an approach. What an approach to nutrition. For policymakers, nutrition is, is about determining the least you can get by on without suffering over disease of a specified type. These were once called, more honestly, minimum daily requirements. Uh, I say more honestly because we put spin on that now. We call them adequate intakes or recommended dietary allowances or something or other, with the implication that we moved away from this minimum concept, but we haven't. For those of us who've served on these panels, you know very well that the number that's picked is the lowest one you can reliably count on not to cause a specific disease, whatever it may be. In this case, it was rickets for vitamin D. Uh, I don't think the general public knows that those recommendations are minimum requirements. That's the least you can get by on. Now, for nutritional uh, physiologists, and I count myself uh, among their number, uh, adult nutrition is about preventive maintenance of tissues and organs. It's about keeping them from wearing out or breaking down prematurely. Uh, its referent is the intake that prevailed when human physiology evolved in equatorial East Africa, wearing no clothes, which is important for sunshine and vitamin D, uh, if you stop to think about it. Uh, the foundational premises of this preventive maintenance model uh, are some, I, I think, generally recognized well, excuse me, generally understood but not generally recognized basic principles. First is that all tissues need all nutrients. The general public has an idea that one nutrient relates to one tissue or one organ or one effect. That's a total misconception in, in my judgment. Uh, the second premise is that shortages of a nutrient impair the functioning of all body systems. The ones that are most obvious are the ones that are got connected with, with the disorder or with the deficiency in its early stages of understanding a century ago. Uh, third, that premature organ or system wearing out is a consequence of nutrient deficiency uh, will vary from person to person depending upon their variable genetic composition. And finally, the expression of nutrient deficiency will usually be pluriform. That is, in addition to the rickets, which we recognize for vitamin D, we would expect to have other manifestations, which we'll be talking about for the rest of the day here today. Now, I sometimes argued that primitive intakes may be ill-suited to modern conditions, and that's entirely possible. But lacking specific evidence to that effect, I think the presumption ought to tip toward the primitive intake. That is, if we know what it is, then we ought to assume that that's what we ought to be reaching until somebody can show that that's not safe. So, after all, what's the justification for privileging the status quo? The burden of proof should fall on those who claim that primitive intakes are unsafe rather than those who claim that primitive intakes are probably what we're adapted to. Now, the preventive maintenance model also recognizes that the organism will work perfectly well without maintenance. What happens if you don't change the oil in your car regularly? It still runs perfectly well just breaks down prematurely. <laughs> so the preventive maintenance model for nutrition reconciles the seeming paradox that an organism can be deficient without being sick. Because it's the failure to maintain the systems and organs until you run out of all of your reserve capacity and then you break down. And this, I think, will be an underpinning of much of what we will be hearing for the rest of the day. But this is true, of course, only for a while. If you don't change your oil sooner or later, your engine will seize up. It's also about squaring the morbidity or mortality curve. And I call your attention to a publication about 20 some odd years ago from Jim Fries at Stanford, uh, in which he put forth evidence that the human lifespan probably was an average of 85 years, plus or minus five. Uh, and if that's the case, then the mortality curve would look like w what we see right here. Now, there are some others who claim that that can be pushed to the right, but it's the principle I'm concerned with and not the specific age. If we look at a survival curve on top of that, then it would, of course, follow that kind of a pattern, uh, which is effectively the inverse of the mortality curve. Now, uh, but in most of the developed or industrialized nations, what we see is a curve that's shaped like that. And the concern is that excess mortality or deficient survival. Um, nutrition has a potential to contribute to this improvement. And this is just not 
my wishful thinking. In fact, that's the underpinning of national programs such as the National Cholesterol Education Program. Whether correct or not is irrelevant. It's the premise under which that kind of a program is launched. Or the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which have been published now for, uh, on, an, uh, on an every five-year basis for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. <coughs> the presumption is if you eat better, you will, you will close the gap between those two curves. And it's uh, the, the role of vitamin D in this reduction is the topic of this conference. Basically, that's what that's what we're going to be looking at and why we're here. Now, <clears throat> to assess vitamin D deficiency, first of all, I think we all uh, these are things that I think everybody here recognizes. Let's just be sure we're all on the same page. Serum 25D is the functional indicator of vitamin D status. It's the major storage form of vitamin D at typical inputs. We can discuss that on a scientific basis later if you want, but I'm going to take that as a given for now. Now, serum 25-hydroxy-D2 is of no value unless the MD is following specific treatment with vitamin D2, at which point then he's able to measure the blood level of the agent that he or she is giving. Serum 125-dihydroxy-D does not measure vitamin D status. And many physicians don't understand that. And many labs, you say, well, I want a blood vitamin D. And the lab says, well, which one do you want? And so it's up to you, the physician, ordering the <coughs> test to be sure that you're specifying 25-hydroxy-D, total 25-hydroxy-D. If the patient happens to be getting a supplement that might have contained D2 instead of D3, that'll be picked up with the total. And that's what the body cares about is the total. Uh, only for research studies and for a number of other conditions would you care about the D2 side of the story. Now, <clears throat> I said 125D measures calcium need rather than vitamin D status. Um, uh, in that sense, 125D is, for, your, for those of you with an endocrinology background, is the analog of aldosterone. If you have a high sodium intake, you don't need aldosterone, and so you don't have much in your blood. But if you have a low sodium intake or if you're sweating a lot and losing sodium, uh, then you'll have a high aldosterone level. So it's an adaptive hormone. And the same is true here with respect to calcium need. If you have a very high calcium intake, then you'll have a low 125D level. There isn't any normal range for it. It's, it's an appropriate range is how we ought to be thinking about it rather than a normal range. Now, I want to show you some data just, to, just a little bit uh, to talk about a vitamin D threshold and how one can approach this issue of adequacy or sufficiency. These are data summarizing the results of uh, five or six uh, studies uh, in which we measured calcium absorption fraction. Calcium absorption, of course, is the canonical, the index mechanism effect of vitamin D. And this is as a function of serum 25-hydroxy-D levels measured in nanomoles per liter. Uh, uh, and you see uh, there is uh, an apparent uh, threshold effect there, peaking at about 80 nanomoles or 32 nanograms per milliliter. <coughs> So for calcium absorption, you would say that the minimum daily requirement would be one that produces a level of 80 nanomoles per liter or higher. Now, I want to stress uh, that it is not the vitamin D or the 25D which is causing this absorption. It is simply enabling the body's regulation of calcium absorption. It's a crucial distinction because we'll see throughout the day today that vitamin D's function is an enabling function rather than a causative function. It causes the enabling if you want to be a, a, a stickler, but in fact, you can have plenty of vitamin D and still not have the vitamin D-related function. For instance, uh, at this point, the body is able to upregulate absorption to um, say 50% or even higher in some people, or downregulate it to 10 or 15% simply by changing the production of 125D. <clears throat> uh, physiological regulation is no longer limited by vitamin D availability at this point. On the other hand, if you're working on the ascending limb of that curve, you've still got the ability to regulate, but you can't regulate it as high. So you don't have the ability to adapt to low calcium intake. And you can downregulate it as well. So the body is still in charge, but it's just limited on how high it can go under the circumstances. So that's the way to think about how vitamin D is acting with respect to calcium absorption. Now, physicians think that vitamin D itself causes calcium absorption. That's why 
uh, we've had to overcome this idea that vitamin D can be toxic in the types of doses we're typically using. It doesn't uh, cause an increase in calcium absorption. It doesn't cause hypercalcemia. It doesn't cause hypercalcuria in the kinds of doses we're talking about. And I'll move to toxicity and safety data toward the end of the presentation. So to kind of tee up the rest of the conference here, the evidence to be presented in all the papers that follow points to a requirement for serum 25D that's above 80 nanomoles, which would be the level required for the maintenance of optimal regulation of calcium absorption. And that could well be as much as 100 to 125 nanomoles per liter. And we don't have quite as good threshold data for many of these disorders. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to return to my pet peeve here about terminology. Uh, if you read the vitamin D literature, there will be pretty general agreement uh, that values of serum 25-hydroxy-D up to 20 nanomoles, or 8 nanograms per milliliter, will generally be described as deficiency. And people saying, you know, what was the prevalence of deficiency in my population? They'll count those who uh, have values below 20 nanomoles, or 8 nanograms. And there's also pretty general agreement that values above, say, 80 would be described in the literature as, uh, say, the normal. That'd be the percentage of my population that had values above 80, you'd say normal. I don't know why they don't use the numbers, but they seem to want to use the labels. And so uh, the boundaries between these labels become important. And it's this intermediate zone that is attracted this term insufficiency, which I tried to point out a few moments ago isn't particularly logical. But the boundary between those two varying in various publications, many of the Europeans like to put this boundary down here in the range of 50 nanomoles or 20 nanograms. And you'll see data today which would suggest it ought to be closer to 100 to 120 uh, nanomoles per liter or 40 to 50 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. So there's some uncertainty about this, but I think the evidence is shifting toward the right rather than toward the left. Uh, and my point is, uh, let's get rid of this ambiguous term insufficiency and call it what it is, that anything up to that cutoff point is deficiency because it's associated with preventable disease or dysfunction. And that's got to be the criterion by which we define whether something is uh, not enough or enough, uh, sufficient or insufficient, uh, adequate or deficient, whatever the terms we, we want to use. Now let's look briefly at prevalence in the population. Some of the first good data were presented from a very interesting study that was published in 1998, 10 years ago, in the New England Journal. A study of 290 consecutive patients on a general medical ward at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. They were admitted for all kinds of different purposes. And here is a display of their serum 25-hydroxy-D values and the serum PTH values. And they were uh, th they were concerned simply to show the adaptation that the body uh, puts into place when there is a vitamin D deficiency, that is, the rise in parathyroid hormone. But this vertical line is the lower end of the, the laboratory reference range, which was 37.5 <coughs> nanomoles per liter, if I'm not mistaken. And they reported in their paper that 57% of these patients on a general medical ward had values below the reference level. Uh, you, you will recall that we can show that there's evidence that 80 nanomoles ought to be the real lower end. I'll get to, to that in a moment. 22% of their patients were below 20, which would have been uh, undiagnosed osteomalacia. And although they don't publish these figures, it's easy to calculate from their data that better than 85% of the entire cohort would have been below 80 nanomoles. So as a kind of a generalization, in Boston, at least, patients on a general medical ward are effectively all vitamin D deficient, the vast majority of them. A paper published from Finland uh, now uh, three years ago took 223 new hip fractures in the southeastern part, the sunnier part of Finland. Uh, 50% were below 37.5 nanomoles, which was the lower end of the reference range for the Boston study. In late summer, that dropped to 33%, and in late winter, it rose to 67%. But I want you to see here that, that, that below 74 nanomoles per liter, or below about 29 nanograms per milliliter, uh, you had effectively 95% of the population, so that 
Uh, this is not all that different from the Boston population. So in two parts of the world, you're seeing exactly the same kind of a thing. I, I, and about the same time, this paper was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, describing 104 northern Italian centenarians, a mean age of 98, and uh, their mean 25 hydroxy-D was only 16 nanomoles, or about uh, 6 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, 99, actually, of those 104 were unmeasurable. And the maximum in anybody was only 21 nanomoles. So here we have an elderly population that is universally deficient. And 14 of them had suffered hip fractures since age 94. Uh, here, uh, to get a more comprehensive look, uh, is uh, the population of of women that we studied in the central part of the country and published a few years ago, uh, and you'll see some data with respect to the cancer incidence in these women, but nearly 1,700 women aged 55 and older at 41 degrees north latitude, and here are their 25 D values adjusted for season. We had a very good seasonal effect, and we had even intake across uh, all the 12 months of the year, so we were able to get a very nice sine curve out of it. And this population was already taking some vitamin D. That is, some were, some weren't, but the median dose was 200 international units per day. Uh, and you see the peak here is about uh, 68, 69, 70, something of that sort, uh, coming out here to effectively nothing above 130, <coughs> uh, and not much below 30 either, thank goodness. Now, <clears throat> here is 80 nanomoles per liter, or 32 nanograms, the reference <coughs> end for uh, calcium absorption. Uh, and this population, uh, after adjusting for season, had 62% below that level, or nearly two-thirds. Now, uh, uh, here are comparable data for N. Haynes, but instead of showing the histogram, I simply show the bell curve, which does, in fact, describe how vitamin D levels are distributed at a population level quite nicely. Uh, and once again, 10% uh, were below the reference range, and 77% were below 80. So these are U.S. population data, basically. And so instead of just isolated anecdotal reports, uh, I think we can take it as a given that the vast majority of the adult population in the United States, particularly those we take care of as physicians, that is, those who are sick with some problem or another and have to be hospitalized, they're going to be vitamin D deficient. Now, I want to ask you, what would this distribution look like if the entire population were to be supplemented with vitamin D, say, for example, with 2,000 international units per day? Well, uh, here is the N. Haynes distribution once again, uh, and uh, it, 2,000 international units would raise that distribution in everybody by an average of about 35 nanomoles per liter. Uh, as I'll show you at the end, this is an average figure, and there's a lot of variability in how people respond, but let's just say we push that distribution to the right, 35 nanomoles. Uh, still, 15% of women are below 80 nanomoles. That is, 2,000 international units at a population level would not get 15% of the people up to uh, where we would think they ought to be, which is at least 80 nanomoles. Uh, and if you buy 100 or 120, for which I think there is some credible evidence, then it's going to take more than this. However, this is a key point. Effectively, nobody would be pushed above 180 nanomoles per liter, which is about, what, uh, um, 70 nanograms per milliliter, something of that sort. And more to the point, what about those who are already two standard deviations above the normal... Uh, uh, down here, what happens to them? Uh, the population would still be below 80 nanomoles per liter, uh, 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 and to get them to the point where we only have 5% of the population, there are 2.5% actually, uh, would take 2,600 international units per day, using the data that we developed on how much 25D goes up for every uh, international unit uh, taken in per day. So uh, uh, the important thing is that these inputs are above current levels. That is, whatever sun exposure, whatever milk you were drinking, whatever uh, supplements you were taking, 2,600 in everybody will produce this kind of a distribution. But notice there's nobody above 180 to speak of. And that, I think, is the good news. You just haven't pushed the population anywhere near toxicity. So there we go.
I got ahead of myself on that. <laughs> we just simply push that end of the distribution up. So let's look a little bit more closely at the safety data. Uh, these were data extracted from a paper published nearly two years ago now in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology uh, using the IOM approach to determining the upper limit, uh, a kind of rigorous but boring approach that goes through all the literature and establishes various criteria. Uh, and you see that there is this kind of a curve which is, which is going up. The blue circles are the means of 15 studies of adults who received controlled vitamin D supplementation precisely for the purpose of answering these questions. And the triangles are the uh, results of eight studies reporting uh, toxicity in individuals in which both the D intake and the serum 25-hydroxy-D were known. Now notice the D intake is on a log scale, starting at 1,000 international units per day, not 100, and going up to 10 million <coughs> international units per day. Now, I mean, let there be no doubt, nobody is recommending an intake of 10 million international units per day. But there are cases of toxicity that fall between a million and 10 million international units per day, so it's important to know what they show. Uh, and the good news is that there is, in the current literature, no toxicity reported below 500 nanomoles, which is 200 nanograms per milliliter. That's not to say there might not be a paper tomorrow that comes out at 190 or something of that sort. But the available literature says uh, that you have to be above 200 nanograms or 500 nanomoles before you have to worry about toxicity. And similarly, there's no toxicity below 30,000 international units per day for long periods of time, not just single doses. And, and, and so the paper concluded that the tolerable upper intake level should be set at 10,000. Now, once again, nobody's recommending 10,000, but you see, that's a factor of three, safety. And even there, uh, 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 I, can't, I can't think of very many clinical situations in which that might be useful, uh, if any. A kind of rule of thumb uh, is that serum 25D rises by about one nanogram per milliliter, or two and a half nanomoles, for every 100 international units per day of vitamin D3. So, to raise a patient from 15 to 30 nanograms would typically require an additional input of 1,500 international units per day. And the emphasis is on additional input. Whatever the patient had to get him or her to 15, he's going to need an additional input of another 1,500 to get to 30. However, and I stress this, there's huge variability around this average, and we don't really know all the reasons for that. I want to show you the results of some um, uh, quasi-pharmacologic studies which we've done in our laboratory which address some of these dosing questions. Uh, this was a group of reasonably healthy uh, adults now published. Uh, we gave them 100,000 international units of vitamin D3 by mouth once, sitting there in front of us. So we know they took it. It was 100 percent compliance. Uh, and then we simply measured their serum 25-hydroxy-D over the next uh, four months. Uh, and you see what kind of a rise you get. Now, first of all, the mean rise was only to 100 nanomoles, which is just barely more than 40 nanograms per milliliter here. 100,000 international units did not produce a really big rise. Uh, uh, there is 80 nanomoles per liter, and you see you're back down below 80 nanomoles by slightly more than two months. So if you were to use this approach to the treatment of, say, patients in institutions for which daily dosing might be a barrier, you wanted to use larger doses, the frequency would be probably once every two months, which, which is probably feasible in a nursing home context. It's a way to get enough vitamin D into everybody. Now, uh, I also want to show you the huge variability within that population. This is the increment to the C max, that is the maximum concentration in each individual. And so we've got 60 some odd uh, uh, points here. Uh, this is the mean rise. It was about 38 nanomoles per liter. Uh, and notice uh, that <clears throat> the C max increment ranged from only 12 nanomoles to 76 nanomoles per liter. If that's a six fold range <clears throat> between the highest response and the lowest response. Now, <clears throat> we checked, of course, for what were the possible 
causes of that kind of variability, and it turns out that half of it is due to body size, which is reassuring, <laughs> because if you put a given dose of any compound into a big volume, uh, it ought to produce a smaller concentration than if you put the same dose into a small volume. But we've never been terribly clear about that in the vitamin D field because we didn't have good data. But about half of this is due to that. But let's factor that out. Here's what's left. We still have a range from 20 nanomoles to 66. It's still a three-fold range after we've adjusted for weight. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting uh, fellow work to be done. And by fellow, I mean for research fellows, postdocs, et cetera, trying to figure out what are the bases for uh, this kind of interesting variability, which we need to understand better if we're going to individualize dosing. The take-home message right now is if you use doses in your patients, they're not all going to give you the same kind of response even <coughs> after you adjust for weight, and we don't know why. Uh, let's look at D2 versus D3 because this question comes up uh, frequently. Once again, Laura Armas working with us did this nice work. We gave 50,000 international units of either D2 or D3. Uh, again, sitting in front of the investigator, we know they got it. We can know exactly what we had in mind. Uh, and here are the two curves. There's D2 and D3, and this, this picture speaks for itself. Now, uh, it's uh, perfectly possible to treat vitamin D deficiency with vitamin D2, and it works. I don't want to leave the impression that it doesn't. And much of the cure of rickets during the first half of the 20th century was done by vitamin D2, or ergocalciferol. But I simply want to show you that uh, in, in uh, our hands at Creighton, and uh, in those of Reinhold Wieth and others, uh, there is a difference in how the body handles these two compounds. And the area under the curve for acute dosing shows a huge difference. That's, that is this area under these curves here, uh, out to 28 days. There's about a fourfold difference in relative potency. Now, once again, you can use either compound. Serum 25D levels below 80 are not adequate for any body system. I hope we can take that away. And levels as high as 120 may be much closer to optimal. It's useful to bear in mind that best estimates of the primitive blood level would have been closer to 150 nanomoles, which is 60 nanograms per milliliter. So that's a, that's a very reasonable level. Uh, inputs from all sources combined that are needed to sustain 80 nanomoles are in the range of 4,000 international units per day. That comes from controlled dosing studies in my laboratory. And in most healthy adults, 2,000 IU per day, in addition to all other inputs, will usually suffice to maintain uh, the blood level for uh, probably 85% uh, of the population at least. Now, I started out um, uh, with some... Uh, uh, some objectives, and Carol has asked me to recap and see where we are. Well, uh, we've seen that a definition of nutrient deficiency is any disease or dysfunction due to a low nutrient intake. Uh, the evidence relating to vitamin D calcium absorptive regulation is suboptimal <laughs> below 80 nanomoles. The vitamin D inputs needed are about 4,000 per day from all sources. The prevalence of deficiency ranges from 65 to 95 percent in most of the studies, particularly the big population-based studies. There's no toxicity for <coughs> inputs up to 30,000, surely none up to 10,000, and uh, the safe upper limit is 10,000. And with that, I thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Schwalfenberg from Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, this is a, applied to uh, adults, I would believe. But what do we do with uh, kids in, uh, at different age groups? What the level of vitamin D should they be taking? Well, um, uh, the evidence from the, the pediatricians that I'm familiar with who are working with vitamin D say that 80 nanomoles is a rock bottom level for kids as well as it is for adults, that there isn't, there isn't any age specific level that we need to worry about. Now, we haven't done enough work, really, to be absolutely certain of that, but I think that's a safe place to start. Now, what input does it take to get that? Well, given the fact that different body sizes are going to produce a different volume of distribution, uh, it makes good sense that smaller individuals are not going to need quite as much as larger individuals. The recent revision in the United States by the Academy of Pediatrics to double the recommended input in children from 200 to 400 was a move in the right direction, uh, 
but that encompassed everybody from one year to age 16, and it doesn't make sense that all those can get by on exactly the same oral intake. So, uh, um, uh, I mean, all I can say is that they're, they're inching uh, or they're millimetering uh, toward the right answer there, but it's a slow process. Hi, Lisa Davison, internist in Seattle. Um, can you talk more specifically about um, replacement doses of vitamin D? You talked about um, to increase the 25 hydroxy D by one nanogram per milliliter, it takes 100 IUs a day, but over what period of time? And then how can we use higher doses and in shorter periods of time to get people to sufficient levels? The um uh, vitamin D is very forgiving in these age, in these ranges, and, and uh, uh, I don't know that there's one preferred uh, number. Uh, I think you have to uh, find out what works in your population and what works with your patients. People with severe deficiency who come into you in a wheelchair because they have bad osteomalacia, you probably want to give a larger dose and that they will respond quickly. But for most of the things we're talking about, which is, falls back into the preventive maintenance model, I, I mean, you kind of think how often you want to change your oil, basically. It's, I, I, I mean, the key is to do the preventive maintenance, not so much to figure out what kind of a dosage regimen. Um, uh, if you've got one of those people who isn't responding very well to your dose, you're going to have to double it or triple it. The approach that we take in our osteoporosis clinic at Creighton is to start everybody sight unseen uh, at 1,000 international units per day. And then we measure three months later, and if they're not where we want them, then we double that to 2,000. And that usually works for most people. Thank you, Dr. Haney, for your, all your wonderful research and presentation. What I'm curious about is, are there additional benefits by being in the top half of the range, say between 60 and 100 uh, nanograms uh, range? Can you extrapolate further? Is, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself in this conference, but is there data to help us there? Well, it's a very important question, and I think the right answer is we don't know. Uh, but I think we can generalize. Most nutrients have a threshold. That is to say, you see the effect up to the threshold value, and then above that level, you don't see any further effect. A classical example is iron and hemoglobin. If you've got a patient with iron deficiency anemia and you put the patient on oral iron, the hemoglobin comes up. But once you get above a normal level, you can keep increasing iron all you want. You don't get any further hemoglobin. You may get iron overload, but you don't get uh, any further hemoglobin. So nutrient-specific effects stop when the body's got enough, for the most part. Toxicity is not just more of the physiology. It tends to be by some other different mechanism. And once again, think in terms of iron and iron overload disease as contrasted with simply supporting hemoglobin synthesis and replacing lost iron stores. Well, we don't have comparable data, but if the if the 25-hydroxy-D data for calcium absorption that I showed you is typical of some of the other effects, and we don't have dose-ranging studies, if it's typical for some other effects, then getting beyond the point where you've gotten your reduction, uh, 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 I think probably is not a wise approach, because we just don't have enough data up there. So I'll stop at that point.